Hello everyone, this is Dr. Justin Rubin, and today we're going to be talking about Anton Webern's Five String Quartet Movements, Opus 5. We're going to be looking at number two today, and the topic for us today is set theory. Before we begin, everyone should take a listen to this movement. Uh, you'll notice that all of the string parts uh, have mutes on, mit dämpfer. The piece is very slow. It says sehr langsam, eighth note equals 56. So it starts off quite slow. But today what we're going to be looking at is um, some of the set theory aspects. So to begin with, if we look at the first chord, or sonority, if you will, that occurs at the beginning of the piece, it occurs between the second violin and the cello. If we collect the notes for the second violin and cello, you'll notice that we have the notes D and A in the second violin, and in the cello we have A flat and F. So what we have to do is get that into the smallest possible space. If we do, we end up with A, A flat, F, and D. Now we have to figure out what the set is for this, so let's call A zero. And now all we need to do is measure the intervals back to A. So A to A flat is one. A to F, four, sem uh, four semitones. And A to D is seven semitones. So overall, the set is zero, one, four, seven. Now we can go back to the sonority, we'll circle the entire thing, and we'll call it zero, one, four, seven. Now there's a very important topic that Arnold Schoenberg had coined uh, around this period of time, the idea of a unified musical space. The idea that all of the elements in a composition are connected to all of the other elements, both in time, in terms of melodic content, and also in terms of its harmonic content as the piece continues on. So let's see if we could find some of these elements. Let's continue on. I'm ignoring the viola part at first. I'm just going to be looking at some of these chords in the uh, second violin and cello, since the whole first passage, as we could see, is consisting of these elements uh, between those two parts. Again, we hear the same exact chord, so it's another 0, 1, 4, 7. Now we look at the third chord. This one only has three notes. We have the note A in the second violin, G in the cello, and also an E flat in the cello. A, again, I'm going to call it 0. G will be 2, because it's two semitones away from A. And finally, E flat. This is a tritone. That's an easy thing to always remember. Tritones are always six because it divides the 12 semitones directly in half. So this sonority that occurs in the second full bar, we have a pickup bar, first bar, second bar. So we're in the second bar. I'll label it here. One and two. Uh, in the second full bar, we have a zero, two, six. Now, if we look, continue on, we have the same sonority that occurs on the downbeat of the next bar in bar number three. And this is, again, we're not considering the viola. The viola has its own melody. It's a separate issue. Now let's continue looking at just what the second violin and cello are doing. So here at the end of bar number three, we have a G in the second violin. We have a C sharp in the cello. It's also double stop with a B. Let's uh, reorganize these notes in a way that makes sense and gets it into the smallest possible realm. And if we do that, if you do a little trial and error, you'll find out that C sharp, B, and G is as close we can get those notes together. Now, I definitely say try this out on manuscript paper because as you kind of rotate notes around when you're, when you're gathering pitches, you can kind of see what's going to be possibly the smallest intervallic content overall because we're always looking for the smallest not from note to note but the smallest overall so if we look at this grouping now we have c sharp this time we'll call c sharp zero c sharp to b is a two semitones and c sharp going back c sharp to g once again that's a tritone it's a zero two six again so that makes us happy because now we've seen a couple of different sets, and one of them with different pitch content, but the same uh, set as something before. Now, to start this over again in some ways, let's take a look at the viola part. I'm going to be doing the viola part in red, just so we can see it a little bit more differentiated from uh, the, the, pe the pencil parts I did in the second violin and cello. So let's take a look at how we can uh, break this thing up. We have this melodic content from the pickup bar to the first bar, and then you have that fermata. 
Let me just grab that and see what we have. We have the notes G, B, a G again. We don't have to consider it twice because it's part of the same phrase. And then finally we have a C sharp. Oh, wait a minute. That looks like something I saw somewhere else. Not only is it the same exact set, but it's exactly the same pitches as a sonority we see later on. This whole idea of a unified musical space, this is a great example of, of how it's being applied here. It becomes more important to Schoenberg the later he gets in his life, but you can see this already in the work around this uh, pre-World War I era. So right here we have a 0 to 6 set. 0 to 6. Or I could put it out here. 0 to 6. Now, can we find... What always is interesting to me is how can we find things that connect within the course of the composition. And never just say, oh, you know, I already found this set, let me just move on. Because often in this music from this period of time, we could see things that have a lot of overlapping elements. If we take a little bit of the next phrase, let's take the G from the first phrase, the C sharp from the first phrase, and then continue on. Even though there's a rest, I'm ignoring the rest. Now I have an E natural and a C natural and a C sharp. So although I have now five different notes, I actually only have four different pitches because the C sharp is repeated. So let's gather those notes somewhere else. So we start her off with a G, then we have a C sharp, E natural, C natural, and then the C sharp, which we already have. And so we have a group of notes, and let's try to figure out what the set is for this group of notes. Well, get it into the smallest possible realm. Let's reorganize this, reorder this. We could have it as C, C sharp, E, and G. Again, if you do this on manuscript paper, it often is uh, very clear to do it that way. I'm just doing it here, just writing down the note names. So if we take a look at this grouping, this overlapping, so we're taking a little bit of the first melodic idea and a little bit of the second melodic idea. Because ultimately what we're trying to do here is discern how Webern came up with pitch material that made sense both melodically and in terms of the overall intervallic content that brings an aesthetic unity to a composition. Uh, it's more than just uh, a decision of contour of the musical lines, but also in terms of its specific content. So if we look at what we have now with this next set, I start with C, I have zero, C sharp, one, because it's one semitone away from C. We go back to C, the interval to E, C to E is four semitones. And finally, from C to G, a perfect fifth is seven. Wait a minute. That is the first sonority that we see in the piece. So what ultimately, and of course I did this through trial and error. One of the most important aspects of set theory is just trying to grab a little bit of material and experiment with it. See what the set is, see if you see it other places. And what we see here in the very outset of the composition, we have melodic ideas and we have harmonic ideas and they're completely integrated. He's using basically two different sets. Ultimately, 026 and 0147, each of them having specific qualities that you notice are not similar between the two. In the 026, we have a tritone in this major second. Meanwhile, in the 0147 set, we have a semitone, we have a perfect fifth, we have a major third. So they're in some ways, maybe you can say complementary sets. One of the goals, of course, of doing this type of analysis is to find where these sets may crop up other places and completely in new ways. Webern was always considering new ways that um, some ideas that occur earlier in a piece can be transformed into something new. For example, at this really beautiful duet between the first and second violins, a little bit more than midway through the piece, uh, it's just this ostinato in the second violin, E flat F, E flat F, and so forth. And you see this really nice arcing melody in the first violin. Well, when examining it a little bit closer, one of the things that we could see, let's just grab a little bit of each, and this is interesting. This is different than the way he did it at the beginning, where you have melodic content, and you have harmonic content, and they're in a certain way separated from one another. 
Here later on in the piece, for example, if I take a little bit of one and a little bit of another, so let's just take this piece of material, E flat, F, and A. So E flat, F, and A, call E flat zero. Well, E flat F is two, and E flat A, that's a tritone, that's six. There we go again. Yeah, even let's take the other, the other way of looking at it. What if we take two notes from the first violin part, A and B, and maybe this F, that we have kind of intersecting the two. Once again, you would have B, A, F, zero, two, and six. So you see that there are other ways that the same uh, types of sets that are used earlier on a piece can be creative, creatively employed later on in a composition.